All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Genetic Variants, uh, Tips and Techniques for Genetic Novel Synthetic Genes. Uh, my name is Laura Gers, and I am a marketing specialist here at Genscript. And uh, genetic variants pay, play a big role, uh, not only in nature, uh, but they can also be invaluable for understanding protein function and regulation, which has many implications in the discovery of new and improved therapeutics. However, um, as you are probably aware, um, creating these variants can be quite tricky, and often protocols require lots of optimization. So in this webinar, I'm going to be covering some of the basics behind genetic variants, um, along with strategies for their synthesis, and, and hopefully some helpful tools for you uh, to make creating these variants much simpler. So if you have any questions during the presentation, um, you can submit them by typing them into the questions field that you're going to see on your screen. Um, and I'm going to do my best to answer them after the webinar. Uh, frequently asked questions along with their answers, uh, as well as the webinar itself, will be posted on our website at www.genscript.com. And um, finally, at the end of this presentation, you're going to receive a brief survey. Um, we encourage you to fill this out as it's going to help us better design and optimize our services to meet your needs in the future. Okay, so um, before I really begin, I wanted to quickly go over um, some of the topics that I'm going to be covering during today's webinar. Um, so first, I'm going to start by presenting a quick overview of genetic variants, what they are, um, what their significance is in health and disease, and also their experimental significance in the lab. Um, secondly, I'll be presenting some, most, some of the more popular methods for generating variants experimentally. Um, and also I'm going to go over some um, advantages and di disadvantages to these methods. Um, in the third part of our webinar, I will be presenting some of the common problems and solutions um, that you might face um, in regards to variant synthesis. And finally, to wrap up the webinar, um, I'd like to describe some of the services that we offer here at Genscript um, that you might find useful for your mutagenesis uh, project. Okay, so uh, before I begin, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Genscript, um, in case you haven't heard of us before. Um, so our company was founded in 2002, and our mission has been to accelerate biological research by offering high-quality services and bioreagents, such as custom genes, peptides, um, antibodies, and proteins as well as our, um, a new service that we've started um, offering a few years ago, our CRISPR edited cell lines and reagents. Um, we also offer a variety of discovery biology services that can um, support drug development. And then we also offer a variety of catalog products to help keep your lab well stocked. We are one of the most highly cited companies in the world, um, including, uh, and with over 10,000 publications that cite our services. And finally, our motto is to make research easy. So really what we want to do is to provide whatever is needed to accelerate research in both academia and industry. OK, so let's get started. Um, so to begin, um, let's talk a little bit about, um, kind of back up, talk a little bit about genetic variants. So specifically, what are gene variants? And what is their significance? So by definition, genetic variants refer to variations in an original gene sequence. These variations can be single amino acid mutations within an original gene, or they can include larger genomic modifications. So variations in genes occur often in nature, and they can have a variety of implications on normal gene function or evolution. So for instance, um, some single nucleide polymorphisms, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, um, may change the coding sequence of a gene. And ultimately, this would affect the wild type function of that particular protein. Um, so in other situations, a SNP might occur in a non-coding region and instead affect gene splicing or transcription factor binding. Um, often these SNPs can be persistent within a population and influence predisposition for diseases 
um, or reaction to pathogens and therapeutics. So alternatively, um, large sections of DNA can also be mutated and cause variation from the original DNA sequence. And um, also, you know, in some cases, these might exist more rarely. Um, in this regard, um, these certain mutations could be beneficial. So for instance, you can imagine, imagine in microbes, for example, um, they could cause changes that improve an organism's fitness, such as allowing them to thrive in what otherwise would be a um, very stressful environment. On the other hand, um, you can have harmful mutations, and this can also occur. And this can cause errors in protein sequences that might re render them completely ineffective. So there are a range of different genetic variants that, you can, that can occur um, in nature. And um, as I alluded to in the previous slide, um, genetic variants can have a huge impact on human health. And on this slide, um, I have listed just a few of the many um, peer-reviewed publication titles that will tell you about how genetic variants, the variants can shape um, all kinds of things, from our appearance to susceptibility to disease. Um, so for instance, there have been many publications recently that have been identifying SNPs um, that influence everything from your hair color to predisposition for heart disease. Um, in addition, uh, there are certain SNPs that are actually beneficial, and I have a, um, a title here from a publication that describes how um, genetic variants or SNPs can actually shield populations of, such as uh, Latin American women um, from breast cancer. So um, these novel gene variants um, can really revolutionize the development of therapeutics um, for a variety of conditions and diseases. And the goal is to find these genetic variants. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we can actually do that. OK, so how can these naturally occurring variants be identified? Um, one of the most common methods for detecting SNPs within a genome is through a GWAS study, or a genome-wide association uh, study. This screen. Um, examines any common genetic variants across multiple individuals to see if there's any variation that is linked to a specific trait. So for instance, um, say you want to figure out if there are specific SNPs or specific variants that cause a particular disease. Um, so what you'll do is you'll compare DNA samples um, from healthy and diseased individuals, and then um, you'll basically look at um, the sampling of alleles between those samples. So for instance, if there's an allele that occurs more frequently in a diseased individual, um, then you might hypothesize that that particular variant is closely associated with that phenotype, um, or vice versa. So GWAS studies are becoming increasingly popular um, and powerful tools for identifying potentially important therapeutic targets. And the number of publications citing um, these types of studies is um, really growing um, exponentially. OK, so while genetic variants occur commonly in nature, why would we want to try and create them artificially? Um, so just as screening for variants can provide us with invaluable information, uh, the synthesis of genetic variants can also help us understand many biological processes. So specifically, by creating genetic variants ourselves, we can create sequences that would otherwise not occur in nature and accelerate a variety of research applications. And for instance, um, there are a variety of research applications that genetic variants can kind of help us um, further understand. Um, and I have here listed just a few of those. Um, for instance, we can use genetic variants to understand structure function relationships of enzymes, um, regulatory mechanisms governing gene expression, um, how uh, proteins interact directly with nucleic acids. Um, and finally, it can give us a broader understanding of, um, of biological functions. So basically, uh, genetic variants um, and synthetic genetic variants can significantly enhance our understanding, understanding of a variety of research fields. 
Okay, so now I've kind of introduced the topic of genetic variants and what their significance is in nature. Um, so now I want to move on to um, the methods for how we can actually create these experimentally. So for when making genetic variants in the lab, there are a variety of methods that can be used. And each method has different advantages and disadvantages, as well as its own specific challenges. On this slide, I've included a list of the most popular methods for generating variants. The first method we'll go over is the creation of variants by inducing DNA damage. Um, this method commonly uses either physical or chemical uh, mutagenesis. Um, and another method is insertional mutagenesis. So this type of mutagenesis in, in, um, integrates larger segments of exogenous DNA into a genome and can result in dysregulation of genes in the neighborhood of the insertion site and in return impacts a specific phenotype. Um, often this can result uh, from an insertion or deletion of mobile genetic elements. The third mutagenesis method I'll describe is saturation mutagenesis, which is a method that attempts to generate as many possible mutations within a small region of the gene as possible. Typically, this is either by cassette mutagenesis or oligodirected mutagenesis. Um, another popular method that I'll be discussing is site-directed mutagenesis. So this is probably one of the most accurate um, and more specific mutagenesis methods that we have available. Um, uh, it employs PCR primers that add substitutions, um, insertions, or deletions into a DNA template. Um, and finally, I'll wrap up by describing um, how de novo gene synthesis or chemical synthesis can accelerate the synthesis synthesis of novel genetic variants. Okay, so as I mentioned on the last slide, a common method for introducing, introducing artificial mutations into DNA um, involves the use of mutagens. So the most common mutagens are either physical or chemical in nature. Uh, physical mutagens um, typically involve radiation, so such as exposure to UV or x-rays. And they create some, kind, some type of break in the DNA. Chemical mutagens are chemical compounds that have a variety of effects on DNA, and it really depends on which compound you're using. Um, on this slide, I have listed just a few examples of common mutagens um, that are used to create genetic variants. So as you can see here, each chemical or physical mutagen creates a specific lesion type. So for instance, Chemicals such as DEO uh, will induce um, interstrand crosslinking, and that when repaired using the cell's repair machinery, it typically results in a deletion. On the other hand, EMS and MMS are alkylating agents, which can create base pair substitutions, um, among others. Physical mutagens, like UV radiation, um, will result in base dimerization and ultimately um, end up causing a, a deletion. Um, while gamma radiation um, usually creates um, strand breaks. So as you can see, um, and, and perhaps you've already practiced this in the lab and you're quite um, well aware of it, um, there are many options for DNA damage-induced mutagenesis. Um, and there are a lot of different protocols that are available um, to employ these services. I have listed here one, one option. Um, and usually these protocols are pretty straightforward and easy to use, which is what makes them really popular in a lab environment. Um, however, there are a few drawbacks um, to these mutagenesis, mutagenesis approaches, and I'll be describing them um, in a few slides from here. Okay, so let's move on to insertional mutagenesis. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, um, insertional mutagenesis is the process of introducing foreign DNA, um, usually one or more bases, into a genome. Um, the most common methods for introducing this DNA are either through lentiviral vectors, um, in, either by lentiviral vector transduction, uh, retroviral infection, infection, and also by transposon mobilization. Um, introduction of the exogenous uh, DNA commonly results in dysregulation of gene function in and around the insertion site. 
Um, so it can be a really powerful tool for many applications. And where we can't, you often see this is um, for cancer, the discovery of cancer genes. So in cancer research, um, insertional mutagens can be introduced into um, your cancer animals, animal model. And then when tumor genesis is initiated, um, you can collect the tumor DNA and then screen it by PCR to identify potentially um, important therapeutic targets and biomarkers. Um, so our, if you're interested in more information on how insertional mutagenesis can be employed experimentally, um, I do have a review right here um, that will give you some more details, um, or a lot more details, um, on how insertional mutagenesis has been used um, to um, accelerate cancer research. And again, this is just one of the many applications um, that this can apply to. Um, and so finally, insertional mutagenesis, again, there are advantages to this method. Um, one is that it's, uh, has, it's quite cost effective, um, and it can also be um, powerful for many functional studies. Okay, so another popular method for creating uh, variants is saturated mutagenesis. And in this method, three bases are replaced, or a codon, are replaced, are placed in the target DNA template with a random mixture of nucleotides. Um, so a simple way of introducing these mutations is by sequence overlap extension, or SOE. And here, PCR is used to amplify DNA fragments at um, a specific um, codon. So the primers are synthesized with the mismatched random nucleotides in the middle, um, such that the amplified sequence will contain the mutated codon sequence. And um, this method has potential for, again, a variety of applications. Um, so especially this is useful for creating a library of mutants so that you have um, variants that span of multiple different combinations of nucleotides. Um, it's also very commonly used for understanding um, how gene, inter gene interactions within a pathway. Um, and also for synthesis of protein variants for functional analysis. So again, a very powerful tool for gen uh, generating genetic variants. Okay, so site-directed mutagenesis. So site-directed mutagenesis is probably one of the most popular methods for introducing mutations. So here the mutation is introduced in a single PCR reaction with complementary primers containing your mutation of interest. The most common mutations generated using this method include substitutions, uh, deletions, and insertions, um, which I have portrayed in this graphic here. So substitutions are created by um, incorporating your desired nucleotide change, um, which I have here designated by an X, um, into the center of the forward primer. Alternatively, uh, deletions can also be introduced into the target gene um, by designing primers that begin at either side of the deletion zone. And insertions can be achieved by using overlapping primers with flanking sequences that contain the additional bases you'd like to insert. Um, so once the appropriate modifications have been made to your plasma DNA, you can then linearize them and ligate um, your product for transfection into your competent cell of interest. So while this is generally straightforward, um, unfortunately, this process can be quite tricky, and maybe you already know this. Um, and so I'll go over some recommendations um, for optimizing your site direct mutagenesis experience, uh, experiments in the next uh, section of this webinar. OK, so there are many advantages to the methods that I mentioned in the last few slides. Um, however, um, with the advantages, of course, come some particular challenges or disadvantages. For instance, while chemical and physical mutagenesis is rather easy to perform, um, it, and it's also relatively cheap, cheap um, there still requires some protocol optimization, um, as there can be high lethality rates, and also um, the rate at which you generate useful mutants um, can be low. Um, in addition, um, you, you have to think first about which muta mutagen you're using um, and which mutation you want to generate. So, for instance, um, you know, as, I, as I 
mentioned a few slides ago, um, you each mu um, each mutagen is biased to generate a specific uh, type of DNA lesion. Um, so you need to choose the mutagen that's going to be biased towards the type of mutation that you want to introduce. Um, and then finally, of course, these are these are chemical mutagens. These are physical mut mutagens. Um, so you need to exercise caution when you use these. And of course, always be careful to abide by lab, lab safety guidelines at, while you are using them. All right, so um, in terms for in, uh, insertional mutagenesis. So um, again, this is a cost-effective method, which makes it popular for certain applications. Um, but there are, again, disadvantages to this method as well. Um, so first is that the insertion can be at a random. Um, and sometimes um, it might not be the best choice if you'd like to control where your mutation is being inserted. Um, on the same vein, um, there can be integration biases, so preference for gene insertion at a specific locus. Again, um, depending on the scope of your experiments, this might be something you want to avoid. And finally, while it's expensive, um, it is labor intensive and it's time consuming. And so if time is money, this is something else you might want to consider. Um, for saturation mutagenesis, um, there are also challenges that face this method. Um, firstly, you really need to consider your primer design, since this is typically a, a PCR-based method. Um, and this can take some molecular biology expertise. Um, so depending on your lab environment, or like what your focus is, um, this could be quite difficult to control. Um, and in addition, it can sometimes be diff difficult to control where the what the mutation is. Um, so for instance, um, since you're inserting random nucleotides, um, you might end up putting in a stop codon, say, instead of um, another amino, um, another codon that encodes for a different amino acid. So again, these are, these are all things to think about prior to starting your experiment. Um, and finally, for site-directed mutagenesis, again, um, since this is a PCR-based mutagenesis method, um, you might encounter challenges surrounding PCR experimental design. Um, and I'm going to touch on this a bit later in this webinar. Um, so for instance, primer sequence optimization can be very challenging. Um, again, it takes a lot of expertise, and um, especially since you need to include the mutation in your primer sequence. And so with this, site-directed mutagenesis can also be um, quite costly just in terms of reagents, but again, time-consuming because you need to, op you know, it could take some extensive optimization. Um, and so we have from some pointers here in this webinar, however, um, that might be able to guide your PCR reaction optimization to do, should this be um, your preferred mutagenesis method. Okay, so now that we talked about some of the more common methods for mutagenesis, I wanted to move on to an alternative uh, to, to these traditional mutagenesis protocols. And this is de novo gene synthesis. So gene synthesis um, allows us to generate recombinant, mutant, or completely novel DNA sequences without a template. So it simplifies the creation of DNA tools that would normally be difficult um, or time consuming to produce using your standard traditional cloning methods. Um, so in the end, you can create small or large numbers of systematic mutants without having to worry about protocols for modify, modifying sequences of existing DNA. So in this graphic, I'm basically outlining the um, some five main steps to DNA synthesis. Um, the first is to design your DNA sequences. Um, so in this step, you can easily design the specific mutations you want at, and at any desired location. Um, you are not limited to what can be created naturally. Um, next, you can optimize and design your oligos, um, which typically are between 40 and 200 base pairs long. Have them assembled, um, cloned into your vector of choice, and then you can apply them into your target downstream action. Um, ultimately, because any errors are corrected prior um, to their synthesis, this is an inexpensive and very accurate way to easily generate gene variants. And at the end of this presentation, I'll be mentioning a few services that we can offer here at GenScript if you'd like to find out more about this option. 
Okay, so now that I've talked about um, some of the more common methods, along with their advantages and disadvantages um, for, ger for generating gene variants, um, I'd like to speak a little bit more about some of the typical challenges that you might face with variant synthesis, um, as well as present some pointers. Okay, so when you're planning your mutagenesis experiments, there are many considerations. Um, while I mentioned some of these on the earlier slides, there are some common issues that scientists might face, um, especially when you're performing PCR-based methods such as saturation um, or site-directed mutagenesis. Um, and so while this list is far from exhaustive, um, I did want to touch upon a few of the maybe the more popular or common um, challenges that people face um, when generating um, uh, gene variants via mutagenesis. Um, the first is what we'll, we'll go over is primer design. Um, so are, there are some ways you can optimize your protocols um, and your success rates just based on how you design your primers. Um, the parameters for your PCR reaction. So often this is a, a place where we see a lot of difficulty. Um, and there are some guidelines for how you can optimize your PCR parameters to um, increase your success rate. And finally, just generating your mutant colonies. Sometimes this can really be a bottleneck um, for people who are perform trying to generate these variants. Um, so in the next few slides, I'll go over um, these concepts in a bit more detail. All right, so let's start with thinking about primers. Um, many times, mutagenesis experiments fail because of poor primer design. Um, for site-directed mutagenesis, for example, primer design is critical for introducing your mutation of interest. And actually, for saturation mutagenesis, this is also true. Um, so if your primers are poorly designed, this could really make or break your experiment. So if this hasn't happened to you, there are, of course, there are some general recommendations um, for your mutagenesis primers. Um, first of all, um, you want to you want your primers to be about 25 to 45 base pairs in length, and you also want your GC content to be at least 40 percent. Um, also, consider the melting temperature of your primers. So, the melting temperature is recommended to, recommended to be at least 78 um, degrees Celsius. Um, finally, you might have to reconsider where you are adding your mutation. So when you design your primers, um, the mutation should be in the middle of your primer. And typically, it is flanked with 10 to 15 base pairs of complementary sequence or correct sequence on either side of the primer. Um, so this can really help um, improve the quality of your primers and hopefully improve your PCR reaction. Um, so if you'd like some more pointers on primer design, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there I think is, is helpful. I have listed here a bioinformatics site, um, PrimerX. So this actually is an online tool that will help you generate uh, primer sequences specifically for mutagenesis. Um, so not only is it a great online tool, but there is also a lot of really helpful information that kind of combines a lot of the information we already know about how to design primers and kind of into one resource. So I recommend checking this out if this is a particular challenge for you. Um, okay, so another common issue that we face with mutagenesis, um, again, specifically with PCR-based methods, is your PCR protocol setup. Um, so you can imagine that many of these mutagenesis pro uh, protocols involve lots of trial and error. And this is not only time consuming, but if you're doing it over and over again, it can become quite costly. So to avoid at least some of this, there are again a few pointers. So first, if your PCR reactions aren't working, try dropping the primer concentration. So ideally, this should be around um, 0.4 to 2 micromolar per reaction. Um, you can also increase your template concentration. Again, recommended concentrations um, lie within 10, I'm sorry, 50 to 100 nanogram um, per reaction. And finally, um, the annealing temperature may also need to be modified. And this is usually based on the melting temperature of primers. So most protocols suggest um, around 60 degrees, um, but again, this could require some adjustment. 
Um, so if you'd like more information, um, I've included another older publication, but I still think it has some very relevant um, uh, methods or protocols, optimized protocols in it. So I welcome you to uh, check that out as well. So finally, another common issue is generating colonies that contain your variant DNA. So sometimes you might find yourself, you, you find yourself not generating, generating any colonies, or maybe you might be generating too many colonies. So what can we do here? Often this begins, yet again, with your original PCR parameters or conditions. Um, if you are getting too many colonies, um, you have a few options. So the first thing you can try is to decrease the amount of template DNA or PCR product for your transformation. Um, second, you can try plating different concentrations of your colonies. And also you can consider decreasing the amount of digestion time. So after, um, after your PCR reaction, your product is typically digested with an enzyme, in this usually DPN1. Um, and this is crucial for isolating your PCR amplified variant from the template. Um, if you're getting too many colonies, then you might, by decreasing the reaction or digestion time, you can ensure that the colonies um, contain mostly your variant DNA and not necessarily parental or template DNA. Okay, so what if you're having the opposite problem? You know, what if you're not getting enough colonies after your transformation? Um, so if this is the case, you could try the opposite. So you can try increasing instead of decreasing the amount of template DNA or PCR product for transformation. Um, alternatively, you might have to play with the reaction condition, so such as increasing the extension temperature. Um, you can also try temperature gradients as well. Um, and again, since this is, really requires a lot of trial and error, I, um, I personally think there are some some good blogs out there. Um, so Bite Size Bio is a great website. It has a lot of blog posts um, from scientists that can help you troubleshoot um, mutagenesis pro uh, protocols. So I would encourage you, um, if these are issues you're dealing with, check out these some of these blogs that um, where that people can use as a useful resource. Because chances are, if you're having these problems, then many others are having them as well. Okay, so um, naturally um, there can be many challenges surrounding mutagenesis, and you know I only listed a few here. Um, but if you want to try and simplify your genetic variant synthesis, there are some other options. Um, in the next few slides, I'd like to describe a few services that GenScript can offer uh, that can take all the guesswork and protocol optimization out of your hands. All right, so one of the first service options that we offer here at GenScript is our Express Mutagenesis Service. Um, this uh, site-directed mutagenesis service is ideal if you don't want to have to troubleshoot PCR design and want a cost-effective way to generate mutants. Um, there are many advantages to this service, um, aside from not having to DIY. Um, specifically, it's very accurate. So our protocols include high-performing polymerases that ensure you only get the mutations that you want. Um, also, it's unlimited. So unlike other DIY methods, um, you can create mutations at any site you want and wherever you want in your target DNA. And finally, you also don't have to worry about your construct size. Our services cover um, mutagenesis and constructs up to 12 kilobases. And um, if you'd like more information about this service, um, please uh, feel free to check the website I have listed here. Um, in a few slides, I'll also go over some uh, case studies where customers have used these services, so it can give you an idea of how this might um, apply to you and what you're working on. Okay, so another service that we offer that you might want to consider is our high-throughput service called Gen Plus HT Gene Synthesis, or high-throughput. Um, this might be especially useful if you want to create libraries of variant genes as it is designed for large gene orders, so usually more than 25 genes. And then as with other de novo gene synthesis services, you don't have to worry about accuracy. It's 100% sequence accuracy guaranteed. Um, our pricing usually is as low as $99 per construct, 
And something that we can also op offer is a codon optimization um, service. So this is free. Um, and what we can do is we can kind of use an algorithm to optimize protein expression levels. So if you're worried or if you'd like to adjust or optimize um, protein expression for your experiments, um, we can help you do that. Um, so if you visit our website here, um, we can also give you some more um, in information on this as well. Okay, so the next service I want to talk about um, briefly is um, our gene variant library services. So this might be especially inf um, in helpful if you work with a large quantities of variants. Um, variant libraries allow you to pursue systematic, unbiased investigations um, such as high throughput screening for discovery biology, um, construction of novel genetic circuits, or um, identifying critical domains for protein structure and function, as well as many others. Um, there are multiple library options that you can choose from, um, and I've listed them here. Again, if you check out our website, we'll have a lot more in detailed information about what, um, basically, the characteristics of each of these libraries. Um, but specifically, they include what we can offer our site-directed mutagenesis libraries, um, scanning point mutation libraries, randomized and degenerate libraries, um, truncation variant libraries, and as well as combinatorial assembly libraries. So I'm just going to back up a little bit and kind of explain the principle behind these gene variant libraries. Um, so perhaps maybe if you can imagine the simplest kind of gene library would be a library that consists of open reading frames or ORFs um, of natu naturally existing gene variants. Um, these variants could then be cloned into expression vectors um, for expression into your organism of interest. Um, and these expression-ready or uh, expression-ready ORF libraries will allow you to char um, characterize and compare the gene, the function of gene variants, um, such as gene family members within or across different species, um, isoform or splice variants, um, disease-related variants um, identified identified through GWAS. Um, and also synthetic mutants that can allow you to study how amino acid variants directly affect protein function. So these are just a few examples of what naturally occur, but why would you want to create a, a synthetic library of, instead of an, a, a synthetic library as opposed to a library of naturally occurring genes? So if you think about it, really, you know, it's just similar to de novo synthesis. So, Creating a library yourself allows you to ensure sequence accuracy. Um, so you're getting the specific mutant that you want. Um, you get expression-ready clones with tags, um, for instance, with tags that make expression assays easier. And also, if your end goal is high-level protein expression, um, you can actually optimize your variant sequences within the library um, to improve protein expression levels through codon optimization. So while gene variant libraries can be powerful tools in research, um, like many others, it might not always be applicable to what you're interested in or for what your end goals are. Um, so for instance, variant libraries are ideal when you want to create a series of variants with mutations that would not normally exist in nature. Um, so you can create new biologically active molecules um, that you wouldn't normally, normally find. Um, they're also good if you want to be systematic and unbiased. So, for instance, if you want to do a high throughput screen, um, like if you're, or if you're going to be expressing genes in different model systems, this can also be ideal. And also because of codon redundancy, you can actually tinker with the genetic code of your variant um, to optimize expression efficiency without impacting the peptide sequence of your end product. Um, and finally, anytime um, really, if you know what sequences you want, um, then synthetic vari variant libraries are great. You know, they can be, you can easily synthesize them, and it can ultimately be a lot more efficient for what you're working on. So when wouldn't you want to use gene variant libraries or synthetic gene variant libraries? Um, so for one, a synthetic gene variant library might not be ideal if you want to create a library from biological samples. 
So a big uh, one example is um, say you're comparing samples from healthy or diseased individuals and you're trying to find specific variants that differ between the two, like your GWAS. Uh, maybe this this probably wouldn't be um, work as useful to you um, because you're working specifically within biological samples. Um, and also, this wouldn't be good if you don't really know what kind of variants you want to generate. Um, so even you know for a randomly generated library, you see, you still need to have some hypothesis. You still need to have an idea um, surrounding the sequence you want to target. Um, so these are all con uh, considerations for if you want to choose synthetic gene libraries. Um, but again, they can be very powerful um, if it's appropriate to what you're working with. So um, I was only briefly able to mention gene variant libraries today in this webinar. There's actually a very helpful resource available um, if you'd like to learn more. Um, so for a more in-depth discussion about, um, about gene variant libraries, please feel free to um, download or watch our webinar. Um, it's available on our uh, webinar gene, I'm sorry, our webinar website on our homepage. And um, it's entitled Gene Variant Libraries, Design, Construction, and Research Applications. Um, so this webinar goes into a lot more detail than what I covered um, and can give you a lot of also very helpful information if this is something you'd like to look into. And uh, this, what, from this website here, you can access um, this particular webinar. And again, it's all free. OK, so now that I've gone over some of the methods that you can use um, and some of the services that we can offer, I did want to share with you some case studies of how GenScripts mutagenesis services have been put into practice. Um, so as alluded to previously, uh, genetic variants can be powerful for identifying important residues um, in proteins that are responsible for their end function. Um, so in, here I have a recent arthritis and rheumatology publication. And in this case, the author sought to identify functional epitopes of a specific PDGF receptor, uh, which is PDGFR alpha. And this is known to be involved in the persistence, persistence of inflammation and oxidative stress that's associated with a condition called systemic sclerosis. Um, and so what they did is they used our GenScript's um, mutagenesis services, and they developed a map of functional epitopes. Um, which is designated in this uh, figure here as Alice scan. And they basically investigated each of these epitopes to, um, to figure out which ones play a role in driving the negative phenotypes associated with this, this, this condition, or specifically um, oxidative stress, which is one of them. Um, so through this type of screen, they could actually confirm um, which epitopes were not only critical for inflammatory responses in uh, this um, systemic sclerosis, sclerosis condition, um, but they could also identify um, potential targets that they could use in the development of antibodies or future therapeutics. Okay, so that's just one example of a case study. Um, and the second case study I have presented here um, but, you know, basically it touches on how mutagenesis can identify, again, identify therapeutic um, targets, um, but also it can enable us to better understand protein and enzyme function as well. Um, so in this case study published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry, um, the authors asked the question how an important DNA repair enzyme, APE1, uh, functions in repairing naked DNA versus DNA within nucle nucleosome core particles. So for very briefly, um, in this study, the authors generated variants that residues predicted to interact specifically with DNA at AP sites, or these are basically sites where DNA is more commonly mutated. Um, and then using GenScript's mutagenesis services, um, they actually were able to find two variants, which um, are denoted in, in this figure, but specifically that's R237C uh, and G241R. And they found that these specific um, mutations compromise DNA repair potential. So ultimately, the synthetic mutagenesis 
allowed them to identify which residues permit efficient DNA processing at AP sites and get a lot more insight into the functionality of this enzyme. Okay, so the last case study that I'll present is, um, um, again, how mutagenesis was used to better understand um, another receptor function, uh, specifically um, G protein coupled receptors. And they wanted to look at how um, this particular receptor is impacted by both post-translational modifications as well as stoichiometry. Um, so in this report, express mutagenesis was used to mutate arginine residues, um, which are, it's hard to see, but they're on this uh, figure here, they're, or they're highlighted in the figure here. Um, and they had predicted that these, um, these residues were going to be important for glycosylation. And so what they did was they, we, they used our mutagenesis services to uh, create point mutations and mutate them to alanine residues. I'm sorry, glutamines. Um, so in turn, they also were interested in stoichiometry. So for instance, this particular receptor is known to dimerize, and that can affect its function. Um, so what they also did was they um, looked at cysteine residues, and they mutated these residues to alanine, again, to see how this would affect uh, disulfide linkages and how this affects um, expression or functionality. And so, again, the sites of these mutations are indicated in that figure. Um, so ultimately, through this precise and systematic mutagenesis method, um, they were able to identify which residues um, e are either glycosylated or participate in dimerization, and it gave them a lot more insight um, into how these G-protein-coupled recept receptors function and how they function in signaling. Okay, so... I know I covered a lot in this webinar, um, and to wrap up, I did just want to kind of give you, send you off with a few um, main conclusions. Um, so really, gene variants are very powerful. They, they help us understand, better understand gene and protein function, and interaction and regulation. Um, variants can also provide guidance and insight when designing therapeutics for many different diseases and conditions. Um, mutagenesis methods are powerful tools for generating variants, but like most experiments, they rarely work perfectly the first time around. Um, but hopefully the information presented today um, can help you with some of the troubleshooting. And finally, if you don't want to optimize anymore, you're tired of troubleshooting, then outsourcing mutagenesis can be a much easier and, and can be cheaper option if you'd rather forego all this DIY. Um, and here are just a few of the helpful um, services that I, I went through today um, that hopefully can help you achieve your research goals. And then finally, to finish off, as I mentioned earlier, um, GenScript really strives to be a one-stop shop for any research need. And we have many molecular biology services that um, would, will help you with your future research endeavors. Um, I mentioned a few of these gene services already, um, but there are many more that we offer. Um, so for instance, for gene synthesis, uh, we can offer uh, gene services with, a, with delivery times in as little as four days. Um, and we also offer, I alluded to this briefly earlier, but um, we also have a patented gene optimization algorithm. Um, so if you're really interested in improving your gene, I'm sorry, your protein expression, um, then this is something that you might find very valuable. And we can provide this at no extra cost when you're, when you're requesting gene synthesis. So in addition, we also offer an extensive list of ORF um, cDNA and custom clones. Um, and these um, start from just $149 a clone. Um, and then, again, in addition to our metagenesis and um, variant library services, um, we also offer a range of CRISPR services, so you might find that these, this is another potentially very powerful method to introduce mutations into a genome. And um, we have a variety of validated vectors, um, so Cas9 and, and Nikkei vectors um, that can allow you to introduce site-specific mutations um, very precisely. Um, so if you're interested in this, I would um, please direct you to our website um, for molecular biology services at the uh, website that I have listed here. 
Okay, so that concludes our webinar. Um, to begin, I just wanted to say thank you very much for attending. Um, so if you haven't already, then please go ahead and type your questions into the questions field that you see on your screen on the GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, I'm going to do my best to answer your questions. Um, if I can't get to them or if I don't know the answer, I promise to get back to you and um, get you the answer um, that you're looking for. Um, so also, again, please complete the survey you received by email. This is really helpful for us. Um, and also, we, have, we do have some more upcoming webinars. Um, so maybe you're in, you might be interested in these. Again, these are also free. Um, we do have many um, archived webinars as well. Um, and so you can find them on our webinars page. And then finally, please feel free to email me at any time. Um, and my email address is listed here. Um, okay, so I will start by answering some of your questions. Um, okay, so we do have one question. This question is, are these variant libraries for TFBS? If so, what is their significance? Um, transcription factor binding sites, I'm guessing that's what this, um, if this question is in regards to, if, if this isn't, then please feel free to correct me. Um, so I, so these, um, okay, so these um, variant libraries, I think they, yes, you could, um, in theory, target um, any sequence that you're interested in. And so this can include the non, um, maybe a non-coding uh, sequence, such as a transcription factor binding site. Um, in terms of their significance, I would imagine, you know, this could um, give you a lot of insight into maybe um, function, if you're trying to optimize, oh, let's say, um, maybe for drug discovery or a variety of applications, um, I can imagine. Um, what I would do is if you're interested in this particular topic, um, I would probably direct you to that webinar. Um, the, the person who gave that webinar has a lot more information about gene variants um, um, than I do. But if it's not there, then if you can please email me and I will make sure to um, get some more information on on this particular application. But again, imagine, you know, you can, again, you can target the, the glory of the gene variant library is you're not limited by, by sequence and it kind of can give you a lot of information about um, a variety of applications, so transcription factors being one of them. Um, so I know that was, hopefully that helped, sort of helped, but yeah, check out that webinar. It's really helpful. Um, it has a lot of information about gene variant libraries. Um, okay, so another question is, if you want to create a point mutation library, do you have to specify which mutations you want um, or can GenScript help you do this? All right, so um, again, I will also direct you to that very helpful webinar um, if you want to learn more. But basically, um, you do need to have an idea of what you want to target um, to begin with. So you need to decide which points you want to mutate. Like for instance, do you want to saturate every mutation at a particular site or do you just want to pick a few mutants? Um, so you might need to think about what do you already know about your protein? Um, do you already know that there are specific sites that you want to focus on? Um, do you really need to screen all thousands of permutations? Um, you know, what's your capacity? Do you want to screen thousands of variants or just a few? Um, so these are things you want to think about um, when you're designing libraries. Uh, but you know, of course, we can always guide you. Um, our technical team is very um, knowledgeable. And we can help you kind of come uh, to some of these conclusions um, if you'd like some help with it. Um, okay, so another question is um, how do you specify which mutations, um, what, what, how do I specify which mutations I want? Okay, so we made this easy for you. Um, so really the easiest way is to download and fill out um, a mutation quotation request form. So on that request form, um, you can actually include which, um, 
basically what you want the mutant to be. Um, so specifically, which nucleotides you'd like to change in the um, original template. Um, and we also have many account managers who can help you design these experiments as well. All right, so this is all the questions that I have here. Um, if, I, if you think of another question, please feel free to contact us. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much for attending. Um, I hope this was useful, and best wishes to you and your research.